Could I, could I welcome everybody um, and ask uh, those of you who would like their seats up front, we also have overflow in the, in the room back there. Uh, I'm really glad to see everyone here this afternoon. I have to say, um, ordinarily you would hold a panel Friday afternoon and only panels on sex or violence would have any chance of, of producing a turnout like this. But I have to say this is certainly the first time since I've been dean that a, a panel on banking regulation Friday afternoon, <laughs> a financial crisis would produce uh, a turnout like this. But I'm, I'm glad to see you all here and I assure you that uh, uh, giving up Friday afternoon at this time will be worth it. We have an extraordinary group of people uh, to speak this afternoon. Now, for me, um, obviously this is not an area of my expertise, but in introducing the topic, um, I have to think about movies. Uh, and for me, my favorite movie of all movies is It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart. Uh, I know looking at it here, it was all before you were all born uh, when the movie came out. But there's a wonderful scene in it, it, It's a Wonderful Life when Jimmy Stewart, who's head of the savings and loan, is returns to the savings and loan and there's a run on the bank and everybody in the community is trying to take their money out. And Jimmy Stewart's the only person other than Potter who understands what's going on and explains to the group that this is a run on the bank for the economists out there, a prisoner's dilemma, and it's a moment in which everybody has to understand what's going on and try not to make the system collapse. He sort of has the, uh, not only the intellectual insight, but he, he in, instills the confidence of everybody around him and saves the day um, for the savings and loan. Now, looking at what's going on in Washington right now, I somehow wish we had a Jimmy Stewart uh, down there, uh, somebody who would both understand what's going on and have the confidence to uh, instill uh, a feeling of everybody that we were uh, easily going to handle this. Uh, clearly, we're, we're in a situation where there was initially a subprime problem, but that subprime problem has stonewalled, has, has steamrolled uh, into an institutional crisis through leverage and other uh, type of uh, activities that is much larger than the original problem. So we have a panel here today which is going to explain exactly how we got into this situation, how it's going to evolve, and how to solve it. How's that for pressure? Um, it, it is made up of uh, academic, modern-day uh, Jimmy Stewart's uh, here. Um, it really, I should mention as an aside, is the best of what this law school and this university has to offer. You've heard me talk about the interdisciplinary uh, specialness of Penn Law School. Uh, we really lead the country in that regard, but it's exactly that type of insight and academic qualifications uh, which have been the centerpiece of the institution as, as well as I think is going to lead uh, to solutions going forward. I also want to brief, make a brief note. I know uh, students here are intellectually interested in what caused this, but there has to be some concerns uh, about uh, your professional prof uh, future. You are, let me say, professionally in the best place you could be. Penn Law School at this moment in time in terms of your career options. Uh, but let me also say we're there for you and, and this is a community and we'll, we will have uh, extra panels should it be necessary on uh, dealing with uh, professional issues both in career planning and otherwise uh, here at the law school. Today, however, of course, um, we're um, viewing this purely from an intellectual academic perspective and we have uh, really an exceptional panel to discuss it. I will go through very briefly uh, telling you about our membership. The channel, uh, panel has been, is chaired and was organized by Professor Tom Baker uh, who, in the center there. Uh, Tom uh, joined us laterally this year. Uh, he is quite literally the top insurance law expert in the United States. Insurance is something which touches every single area uh, of the economy, so he's a particularly good person to be the impresario of this. He also, needless to say, focuses on issues of the insurance industry itself and has spoken um, in the national news on the AIG bailout. If you saw yesterday, insurance industry was hammered 
uh, in, in their stocks. On the other hand, they're up uh, this morning quite significantly. But I think Tom is, is an excellent person uh, to speak of that more specifically as well. Then we have uh, on the far left, uh, Professor Susan Wachter, the Richard Worley Professor of Financial Management uh, at the Wharton School. Um, she was actually described to me yesterday as the most knowledgeable person in the country on the subprime issues. How's that for pressure? Uh, she's co-director of Penn's Urban Institute. Uh, she's a former assistant secretary of housing and urban development and chaired the real estate department uh, at Wharton. She has an appointment by marriage here at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. She's married to Professor uh, Michael Wachter, um, so she's very much as well a part of the Penn Law community. Uh, to her right, uh, we have Professor Jill Fish, uh, who also joined us uh, this year uh, at Penn Law School. She is premier uh, securities regulation scholar in the United States. She's published extremely widely and cited widely in this area, focusing on the SEC's regulation of corporate markets. Uh, she is uh, chair currently of the American Association of Law School section on securities regulation as co-chair of, um, former co-chair of the New York City Bar's uh, Committee on Corporate Law. Professor Richard Herring, the Jacob Saffer Professor of International uh, Banking, who should be over on the far right, he was called away and will be here for the panel, but um, he's apparently dealing uh, with a specific issue in this crisis uh, and uh, by telephone at the moment. Uh, Dick is co-director of the Wharton Finance Institution Centers, formerly of Vice Dean at Wharton, and co-director of their Louder Institute in International Programs, uh, clearly a uh, premier expert in the country in banking and financial institutions. He was described to me yesterday, um, who had seen him on another panel, as providing the most incisive analysis of uh, what is going on in the country right now. So we look forward to hearing from Dick. Uh, and last, but absolutely not least, we have uh, Professor David Skeel, the Samuel Arsh Professor of Law. Uh, David. Um, has the interesting quality of being not only a premier scholar of corporate law, written a very well-regarded book, Icarus in the Boardroom on Corporate Law Scandals, but also premier scholar on bankruptcy law, wrote a book, uh, Debt's Dominion on Bankruptcy Law, which is extremely well-cited and well-regarded. Um, so he brings to this issue a knowledge not only of corporate law, but of um, uh, bankruptcy as well, which may be an issue coming down the line. Um, <laughs> He's also uh, what we would call the Chris Matthews of academia. He appears uh, uh, repeatedly uh, in national um, media outlets uh, talking on these issues. As you can see, this is a multifaceted panel uh, looking at this issue from a whole variety of different uh, areas. This is a problem that requires it. Um, there may be a lot of individual issues that created uh, what some people have called as a crisis, but obviously to understand it, you have to look, uh, step back and look at it as an as a, uh, entire problem. So, in any event, at this point, I want to turn this over uh, to Professor Tom Baker, who will be chairing the panel. Tom. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm, my role is mostly to be traffic cop, but I'm going to do one uh, commercial, which is I'm teaching a seminar next semester, which I thought was going to be historical about insurance insolvency. I thought I'd have trouble having students take it, but now maybe it'll be. So that's, that's the, the infomercial. Um, we're going to go in the order of people on the platform, and uh, let me just give you a quick overview of what they're going to talk about. Um, the, Susan Walker is going to talk about the housing bubble and about mortgage problems and about Fannie and Freddie, which you may have heard about and wondering what those are. Um, Jill is going to talk about the securitization of the mortgages, the role of the rating agencies, and the role of swaps and related credit enhancements of these derivatives that you might have been hearing about and, again, wondering what those are all about. Um, Dick Herring uh, will, was to talk next, and he's going to talk about the banking angle. We'll, if he gets here in time, we'll have him go third. Otherwise, he'll go last. Um, and then uh, our own David Skeel is going to talk about the bankruptcy angle, uh, and I won't try to anticipate what the right jargon is for that. And my, mm -hmm. my job is to keep people on time, and I'm the jargon cop, so that if someone uses a word that I think some of you might not understand, I'm going to ask them to just give a quick little um, ex uh, def de definition. So Susan, uh, please lead off. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, although the circumstances are certainly very concerning. 
uh, for the nation and indeed for the global financial system. Uh, to know how to go forward, we do know, need to know the sources of the financial upheaval, not only for the short-run solutions, but also, very importantly, for the long-run solutions as well. So my comments today, brief they, as they will be, and I do encourage questions, uh, will be on the sources of the crisis. Uh, the crisis has been long in making. Just to use The Economist to track since the past year or so, uh, in March 2007, uh, The Economist pointed to a sinking housing market. Then in January 2008, uh, we had the financial storms. What's next in September is the whirlpool of destruction, which began with the U.S. housing market, but actually began even earlier than March 2007. And the global financial crisis, there is no doubt about it, was made in the USA. And I'm going to show you some statistics uh, to point that way. It's triggered by actual and prospective losses on U.S. mortgages. Really the question in front of us, is this bad luck or is it inevitable? And I think that it is clearly, no doubt about it, inevitable. Predictable, also predictable. In fact, many of us were predicting it. It started with a boom-bust housing cycle. But the question is, why the boom-bust housing cycle? Now, this isn't the only boom-bust housing cycle, and it's not even the only boom-bust housing cycle that was caused by lending. Ultimately, the boom-bust housing price cycle was caused by a credit cycle that mirrored it. It was easing of mortgage lending standards followed by extreme tightening. That, too, has happened before. So this crisis is made in the USA, but it has happened. It's happened in Asia in the late 1990s. It happened in the SNL crisis in the US, and there's a worldwide thrift crisis, banking crisis at that time. So the underlying sources are similar in all these crises, but I will focus on this crisis, and we can, in questions, go to the other crises and similarities if you'd like. The key is that the housing prices boom that was induced by the credit boom was not sustainable. And the key, in short, is loans could, that were made, loans were made that could not be paid. Mortgage payments could not be made. Loans were made with mortgage payments due that could not be paid. We've been there before. In the Great Depression, a majority of loans were bullet loans. That is, they came due in a few years in their entirety, and they could only be repaid if housing prices would allow refinancing. Similarly, we had loans where mortgage payments were doubling, tripling, and they could not be paid because they would be much of households' incomes, and they could not be refinanced. But the question is why? Why did this happen? And in order to we need to answer that in order to answer the question of what now and long run, how do we change things so that it does not happen again. Part of the reason why the destruction was so deep is that we have this long run up from 2000 to 2007 during the credit boom portion of the cycle where housing price increases masked, hid the problem. What was being used on Wall Street, why it was being used is another question, as the parameter for make the loans, don't make them, AAA or not, was defaults were not increasing. But of course defaults were not increasing because housing prices were going up. And as long as housing prices were going up, it doesn't matter how bad the loan was, you could refinance again, perhaps even into a worse loan, but you could refinance because the key for whether a home goes into foreclosure or not is whether you can sell it and get some equity out of it. And as long as prices were going up, you could do that. Now this chart, which shows that housing prices almost doubled from 2000 to the height 2006, almost doubled, 100% increase almost. This chart also is 
shows the deep, destructive impact of the problem. Because today, the prices of many people's loans is beneath their mortgage amount. It's been estimated that almost 40% of homes today, prices, their house prices, is beneath their mortgage amount. That is, their equity is negative. Made in the USA, can't see all this in detail, but the main line, which is on the right, falling dramatically, and if you see that before, the part rise, uh, that's a 50% rise relative to our eight, uh, seven industrial peers, and the fall obviously is dramatic. But that price rise looks small. There was, in fact, a global boom, but we outdid it because only us had special securitization, which I will now go to that briefly because I have a five-minute morning. <laughs> and haven't gotten to the sources. Well, the decades of securitization is the problem and not the problem. Because in fact, we did have from 20, 25 years of securitization without a problem. Historically, securitization was not securitization of default risk, however. It was securitization of interest rate risk. And the securities traded. So they were marked to market. There were short sellers who kept the pricing of the securities and therefore the ultimate mortgages in line. So there wasn't this false, really cheap mortgages out there. But what that was replaced with in 2000, 2007 was private label securitization of this toxic debt, which was not marked to market. So there were no short sellers. So that the price of the risk was allowed to uh, be basically not priced at all. Therefore, mortgage rates did not go up. And affordability, false affordability, false loans could continue to be made. They were marked to market, marked to model. Here is a huge expansion. The underlying blue line is financial and government, blue and green are debt. Most of the expansion of toxic debt was to households and to financial companies. It was almost entirely since 2004. Those light bars that you see are interest-only mortgages, but you can, these are all toxic mortgages, and they didn't exist. They got more and more toxic, but they did not exist before 2000. Uh, here, just very briefly, you can see from 2000 to 2007, FHA decreases, conventional mortgages decreases, jumbo decreases, subprime uh, increases dramatically, Alt-A increases, not through 2007, obviously, that's when we retreated, but from, uh, goes from 7% to 20%, subprime, Alt-A goes from 2% not existing to 13%, and HELOCs also. Again, you're not going to be able to see this, but there's huge deterioration within each one of those product types, consolidated loan-to-value ratio going from 3 fourths to nearly 100%, again, uh, going on. And these loans were made in particular places in the United States. They were made in the darker areas where we had uh, it, the need for these false affordable products, these aggressive products. And this is where house prices increased. And uh, I think we're missing one slide, or perhaps it comes later. We'll skip it. Maybe it'll show up. For some reason, it doesn't. That's where house prices are falling. OK, how did this come about? Here is the uh, circle of, of pointing fingers around a blame. And it's coming around, starting with the borrowers who borrowed at teaser rates, which they could not afford to pay when the rates uh, spiked. But they were told that they could refinance. Prices would go up. Who originated these? These were not originated by banks. These were not originally banks who, who kept the loans in portfolio. A new distribution system of loans originate to distribute so that the banks did not hold the risk. The secondary market securitized, but they didn't hold the risk either. Uh, perhaps uh, others will talk about the detail of why that was. The regulators had an out also. They uh, gave their imprimatur of AAA uh, current conditions out on every one of these papers. Now, who were the investors? To me, that was the major puzzle, because obviously there was risk here. The investors, to some degree, had the toxic um, mortgages, but they also had insurance, quote unquote, CDS, uh, credit default swaps, and Jill Fish will be talking more about that. Now, who indeed owned the credit default swaps? Well, they were AIG, the other insurance companies are too big to fail. That is us. So the circle goes around. But what was making the circle go around were the huge fees at every step of the way, tremendous profits.
Uh, what about Fannie and Freddie? Were they the cause? Well, actually, their share of the market, which you can see right here, did not increase. That's the top line. The FHA plummeted, and that uh, line, which is a uh, dotted line, shows um, the increase in subprime, which took uh, a tremendous part of the, of the market from FHA, as did All Day, which is not on here, but by 2006, together, we're 40% of the markets. Uh, Fannie and Freddie did contribute in 2006 and 2007. They purchased Alt-A. They were not subprime purchasers, but Alt-A into their portfolio. And um, they just the very concept that they were too big to fail. But they were, and they, Alt-A was 40% of their losses, but they were actually not a majority of the Alt-A market. So they were one player, but they weren't the key player. Market and regulatory failure, we had both. Uh, we had risk-taking without accountability, institutions that were too big to fail and too small to sue went under. The bottom line is there is market failure. Underpriced risk is inevitable. Paper that uh, just wrote, which came out a month ago, on the inevitability of the underpricing of risk. Uh, we can now spend an hour and I can give a lecture on that. But it is, in short, competition race to the bottom for fees today and we don't need to worry about tomorrow. Thank you. OK, so um, Susan talked about bad loans and bad loans that created a problem when the housing bubble burst, as all bubbles invariably do. Bad loans are both a cause of the problems in this market and a consequence of the changes in the way mortgage loans are made. And in particular, what I want to talk about here is securitization. Now, we've actually had securitization of mortgages for a long time. And let me talk a little bit more about what that means. In the old days, in the It's a Wonderful Life Jimmy Stewart days, um, a bank took in money by um, receiving deposits and it paid interest on those deposits, and then it had money that it could lend out to homeowners in the form of mortgages. And the bank made money on the difference between the mortgage interest rate and the interest rate on the deposits. So some people called banking a three to six to three business because you'd pay 3% on the deposits, you'd receive 6% uh, on the mortgages, and you could be on the golf course by three. It wasn't a very complicated business model. Right? What changes is the banks, instead of hanging on to these loans and servicing these loans and therefore having a long-term interest in making sure the fundamentals of the loans are sound, instead began selling the loans. Now, securitization actually starts with Fannie and Freddie. And as Susan said, it's been going on for years. Fannie and Freddie took mortgages, bundled them together, and sold interests in these mortgages, what are called mortgage-backed securities. And mortgage-backed securities as a concept make a lot of sense. Number one, it frees up capital. Banks sell the loans, no longer have uh, their capital tied up, and can go out and lend money to future homeowners and businesses and so forth. Investors can enter into the mortgage debt market can invest essentially in real estate without having to do the f detailed work of holding the mortgages themselves and doing the investigation and so forth. And the way Fannie and Freddie did this was by setting pretty strict requirements, uh, um, only purchasing what are called conforming loans, limited in amount, uh, limited initially in terms of the type of loan. For a long time, Fannie and Freddie only bought conventional 30-year fixed interest rate mortgages and limited in terms of the credit worthiness of the borrowers. Securitization, however, expanded beyond Fannie and Freddie. Other people, securities firms, investment banks, began pooling mortgages together and selling an interest in those mortgage pools. And this is the transformation from the somewhat traditional mortgage-backed security to the CDOs. What the CDOs are is a financial interest in a pool of mortgages. The mortgages as packaged by the investment banks no longer were limited to $417,000, no longer were limited to 30-year fixed loans, no longer were limited to uh, credit-worthy borrowers. Um, 
investment banks could package anything. And the theory is that if you bundle a bunch of these loans together, you reduce the risk. Um, we don't need l loans that are limited in amount, because if we've got 100 loans or 1,000 loans that are pooled together, the default risk of any specific loan on the overall pool is relatively small. We diversify across this broad range of mortgages. We reduce our risk. So um, uh, issuers, investment banks, put these instruments together and sold pieces of the pools to other investors. And once this process got going, it was possible to, possible to do it in ever more creative ways. Fannie and Freddie essentially passed through the interest and principal to the investors. Um, CDO issuers created tranches in order to break up the risk of owning a piece of this mortgage pool in different ways. You could have a senior risk, which meant that if some of the mortgages in the pool defaulted, that didn't affect you. You got priority over other investors in that CDO pool. You could have a junior risk, which meant that you only got paid off if everybody else got their payments first. Um, obviously, uh, it was easier to sell the senior instruments because they were safer, they were more secure. So we could take a risky pool of assets and then say, okay, some of the investors have seniority, therefore what they are purchasing has less risk. Now, you're asking, okay, what do you do with the junior risk? And that's where we get the instrument called a CDO squared. We take the junior risks and we create a new investment vehicle. We pool them again. We cut up the investment interest into pieces yet again. And by doing so, again, we d diversify. Ad again, we make some investors senior to others, and we create more saleable instruments. Now, a key player in this whole enterprise is someone that Tom mentioned, and that's the credit rating agencies. The credit rating agencies were a key player because these are debt-based obligations. And for many investors, the decision or even the legal ability to purchase those obligations depends on their credit rating. Credit rating agencies evaluate the risk associated with debt instruments for a fee and rate that instrument, A, B, C, or some variation thereof. The credit rating agencies, however, had no history with respect to these instruments because they were new. They hadn't been uh, issued before, at least in this form. There was no market experience. And there are some concerns about the credit rating agency incentives. For example, they got paid to rate the instruments, but if they rated them too low, they couldn't be sold. Therefore, the credit rating agencies had the obvious incentive to rate them highly enough that they'd be saleable, otherwise they wouldn't get repeat business. But there was also the problem that the credit rating agencies, in terms of their risk models, looked primarily to the old mortgage-backed securities, the old Fannie and Freddie story that had been dealing number one, with very different instruments, with much lower risk, and with a market that for the most part had been steadily increasing in value. So the uh, uh, possibility or the likelihood of a widespread decline of the type that Susan's charts detail wasn't something that factored heavily into those models. Now with hindsight, obviously, we can recognize that it should have. We also know that it doesn't really help, diversification doesn't really help if all of, your, all of the investments in your pool are correlated, right? If you have 1,000 mortgages and the housing market declines, it doesn't help that you've got 1,000 mortgages instead of only one. In some ways, it might be worse. Um, but, but that didn't figure uh, sufficiently heavily into the credit agency models. So these instruments were put together, they received uh, investment quality credit ratings, and they were therefore saleable. Now, with two minutes left. <laughs> um, who bought these instruments? Well, the interesting thing is, a lot of the investors who bought these instruments were major financial institutions. There were hedge funds, there were securities firms, there were investment banks. In some cases, they held on to these instruments because even with all of these financial manipulations, the very weakest parts of these pools couldn't be sold, right? You've got the junior uh, instruments in a CDO squared, and you can't find a buyer. 
So you hold on to the instrument yourself. And obviously, if you've got uh, large positions in these instruments by financial institutions, and the instruments suffer a substantial decline in value, which is what happened, the financial uh, um, solvency of these financial institutions is, is threatened. All right? um, this is magnified by the use of credit default swaps. And let me just very briefly say what credit default swaps are. Credit default swaps allow an investor to hedge against the insolvency or the default of a corporation or another entity. It's essentially buying insurance against the risk of a default. And in the old days, credit default swaps were used by people who owned corporate debt. You've got a bunch of bonds, the issuer is risky, you don't want to sell the bonds, so you essentially enter into a contract in which the counterparty agrees to pay you if the bonds default. Now, that contract is only as good as the solvency of your counterparty, right? If the counterparty can't pay when the bonds default, your contract isn't worth anything. So you've got people who are hedging their risks in the financial market by buying credit default swaps, but for the most part, and there are some exceptions, they didn't adequately plan for counterparty risk. Now assume that your counterparty has billions of dollars worth of CDOs, and those CDOs are suddenly down in value and extremely illiquid. They can't be sold. What's that piece of paper worth? that you're holding that says, pay me if there's a default. It's not worth very much. And that counterparty risk and the presence of those credit default swaps is what causes the credit markets to dry up. Because all of a sudden, people can't trust the financial institutions with whom they've been dealing. They don't know what they're worth. They don't know how many bad assets they have on their books. So they're not willing to lend the money. They don't know if that money is going to be repaid. They're not willing to enter into contracts with them because they don't know if they're going to make good on those contracts. And that's, in a very oversimplified way, how we get from housing market crisis to financial market crisis. I'm going to change the subject a little bit, um, and I'll eventually, in about 10 minutes, end up in bankruptcy, which is where I usually end up. Um, <laughs> to me, the uh, two most striking things about the current crisis have been, first, how long it's taken for there to be any significant legislative intervention, and second, that the legislation we're talking about that the House is going to be voting on this afternoon still doesn't include any significant regulatory reform, at least from my perspective. In terms of the length of the crisis, the crisis goes back at least uh, a year and three or four months, the summer of 2007. Um, in terms of legislative reforms, the only substantial reforms we've had thus far have been the housing reforms in August that Congress passed and now the bailout that's being um, potentially passed um, this week, neither of which is significantly reforming the regulatory structure in any way. Uh, both pieces of legislation are in many respects all carrots and almost new, um, no stick. So the question I want to raise is why is this? Why has it taken so long for there to be regulatory reform and why even now do we not really have any? The key moment uh, in answering this question it seems to me with respect to the delay in responding and the absence of regulatory reform in my view was the collapse of Bear Stearns back in the spring, back in March Bear Stearns confirmed something that we, we really already um, knew, which is that financial intermediation in this country and really around the world has been utterly transformed in the 75 years since the major regulatory framework was put in place, since the securities laws of 1933 and 1934 and the banking laws of 33, 34, um, 35. So there's been a complete transformation in the way we do banking, the way we do financial intermediary, uh, intermediation uh, in this country and in the world. And a good illustration of this 
with Bear Stearns is the fact that although Bear Stearns was an investment bank, the Fed and Treasury treated it very much as if it were a commercial bank. That is, if it were the kind, as if it were the kind of bank that takes those sort of deposits, makes the kinds of loans that Jill was talking about a moment um, ago. So Bear Stearns' failure and the Fed's and Treasury's response to it just underscored that we are in a different financial world than we were in when Congress put the existing regulatory framework in place. The key decision with respect to Bear Stearns, it seems to me, was the decision to bail Bear Stearns out and to effect a sale to J.P. Morgan rather than allowing Bear Stearns to collapse or uh, Bear Stearns to use the bankruptcy process. Although this may have been the right decision, I think there's some debate about it, but it may have been the right decision. The important effect from a regulatory perspective, in my view, is that it short-circuited the political process. Historically, nearly all of our major federal corporate and banking regulation has been enacted in the wake of spectacular collapses, usually a series of collapses, and we could give evidence throughout history, but just to mention a couple, in the 1930s, major corp uh, corporate collapses, such as the collapse of Thomas Edison's former right-hand man, Samuel Insull, that's what this image is. Uh, you know who the, the figure on the left is, that's Teddy Roosevelt. This is Samuel Insull with him in happier days for both of them. Um, Samuel Insull collapsed spectacularly, brought lots of ordinary investors down with him. As a result of that and some related collapses, we got the securities laws of 1933 and 1934. As a result of the bank failures that we've already been talking about a little bit, we got major reform of our banking legislation, uh, most prominently in some respects, deposit insurance, the deposit insurance that may be about to get lifted um, this afternoon or in the next couple of, of days. The amounts may be about to get lifted. So 1930s, major collapses, major reform. 1980s, um, major collapses of SNLs and banks. Banks, we get major reform. Um, and after Enron and WorldCom in 2001, 2002, once again, major reform. So why do we get this reform after a major collapses um, such as these? Well, the short answer is the effect of the collapse is to galvanize public opinion. Most of the time, you don't have 200, 300 people sitting in a room like this, I wish we did, um, but we don't, talking about banking and corporate law. But when we have a collapse, all of a sudden, people start to think about it a little bit more. When a large corporation or a major bank collapses, um, that dynamic is nationwide and we get a, a a lot of people who ordinarily wouldn't be paying attention to these issues suddenly paying attention and demanding reform. And my favorite um, illustration of how this dynamic works and the evidence of it is what you see in political cartoons. Political cartoons aren't usually about corporate law and banking. After Enron and WorldCom, they briefly were. Um, so that here's one of the cartoons about Enron. It's a pickup on the Fear Factor TV show. What it says is, next on Fear Factor, we lower Ken Lay into a cage filled with defrauded Enron investors. Um, we get these kinds of cartoons, we get reforms. We bail out a firm like uh, Bear Stearns, we do not get reforms. We delay reforms um, rather than getting them immediately. Um, so that's one of the main points I want to make. The other main point I want to make is that people, when Bear Stearns failed, assumed that bankruptcy couldn't possibly be the way to deal with that failure. Um, that may have been right, but as a general principle, that investment bank failures can't be handled by our bankruptcy pro um, process, I think that's wrong. I think our bankruptcy process can handle investment bank failures. I think it could handle investment bank failures even better if we changed one set of rules, and these rules are the treatment of derivatives in bankruptcy. Derivatives are given a special dispensation, 
in bankruptcy. If we change that, I think we could quite easily use Chapter 11 to deal with investment bank um, failures. There's some complications. I'd be happy to talk about them in the Q&A um, if people are interested. But my main point is don't give up on bankruptcy. And in fact, if you think the Fed ought to be involved in these failures, bankruptcy doesn't preclude that. The Fed could be involved in, in many of the same ways it has been um, in bankruptcy, just as it has outside of bankruptcy. Um, the test case in some ways for this has been Lehman, since Lehman has failed and has used the bankruptcy process. I think that Lehman's not really a good test case because bankruptcy wasn't considered a live option with Lehman. Bankruptcy was a last resort after the Fed and Treasury pulled the plug. But even putting that to one side, so far it looks like the bankruptcy process has worked okay in Lehman, and I can talk about that um, as well. Finally, I'd just like to emphasize one more time, to me the most striking thing about this crisis is we have a regulatory framework that clearly needs to be reworked. We've got proposals out there for reworking it. None of it is on the table right now. And one of the ironic things about the bailout being, uh, being voted on this afternoon is one of my students pointed out in class um, yesterday is that the main complaints about the bailout have been the number of dollars involved, the $700 billion. So what do we do to make the bailout more palatable? Well, we add a couple more hundred more billion dollars to the package. Um, so I'll stop with that. Okay, Dick Herring obviously is not here. So what I thought we would do is just proceed directly to questions. And what I'd like to begin um, is just to ask, is it changing this tune just a bit, is I'd like to ask people what they think this means for people who are students, you know, people who are looking at, you know, you're, you're, you're taking a time out of the career market, investing in your human capital, getting ready, you know, to, to, you know, for what comes next. And so I just, I'd ask people to think about this ahead of time. You know, what do you think this means for, uh, for students at Penn Law School and, and the university? Is this us? us. Or? You. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was uh, hoping the it's students the guy would behind, right? say, uh, say what it means. Well, I, I think one thing that's happening in all of this, I think the law firm market is really also in the process of being transformed, not just because of this, but because of other things that are happening, um, such as outsourcing of legal services to India, which is uh, something that people hadn't even thought about in the past. I think it's a different world. I think what ends up happening, at least in the short run, is the kinds of areas that firms are looking for people in are gonna shift a little bit. And so um, my area of bankruptcy is one where, um, uh, like it or not, it's gonna be a growth area in the next few years. And so I, I think the most immediate shift will be a shift in what sorts of students and what sorts of areas firms are looking for. I think what the um, crisis puts on the table is a debate that law students and business school students deal with all the time, and that is the relationship of regulation to the financial markets. Should we have regulation? How much regulation? Do the markets function pretty well on their own? Can there be market failures, and should we care? Um, and one of the things that I think is very interesting about the proposals that are on the table is they don't get at that fundamental question. We see a lot of people shifting sides. We see a lot of policymakers who've basically been against regulation kind of rushing to regulate in one form or another. But the um, ongoing lessons, and I think these lessons apply whether you're a student, whether you're in business, whether you're a regulator, whether you're a lawyer, are the extent to which, because we've got so much interdependency, because there are ripple effects from uh, Wall Street to Main Street into people's lives, the extent to which we should care about not just market failures, but market movements, market corrections. If the housing bubble is uh, going to burst, and that affects a lot of people, both directly because they're housing in the housing market and indirectly. Is that something that we need to regulate just to minimize the effect of a market correction? And I think those policy questions should be on the table and are something that going forward we're going to have to answer. To take up uh, where Jill left off, 
four of the la three of the four most recent financial crises, macroeconomic crises in the U.S. and the world were asset bubbles. Uh, the one, uh, Enron was an asset bubble too, but it wasn't a serious macroeconomic crisis, although there was a recession. So we need a, in the same way that economists and lawyers, policymakers, practitioners across the board are focused on issues of cycles in the macroeconomy and avoiding a depression through um, sharp cutbacks of money supply, for example. We've learned how to manage the monetary system. We've learned how to avoid inflationary crises and recessions following that. But we have not learned how to deal with asset bubble crises. And that's going to have to have long-run attention from many players. Secondly, of course, there's going to be plenty of litigation going forward. So there will be room for legal work. <laughs> I just want to add uh, my two cents on that, which is that you know one of the things that I hope this that people take from this is something that I know Mike and other people have been saying to you a lot, but maybe you'll really believe it, is that people aren't going to have the same job for their whole career in the future. I mean, there may be the odd person who does, but that generally people aren't going to have the same job for their whole career. People are going to change jobs because the organization that they work for maybe changes what it does and so you don't want to be part of it. Or the organization that you're involved in, you know, goes out of business. And so, you know, one of the things that I hope that, that I would take out of this if I were a law student is the need to learn as much as I can about as many different kinds of things as I can and to be aware that whatever I'm doing, I need to have maybe not an exit plan, but the sense of, of, of what are the options out there beyond and that you know and that you know so what happens when you're not connected to an organization to, as a workplace for your whole life it means you have to be connected to other people to your classmates to people that you know that and that and that, you know that you all are going to be in a certain sense uh, an organization that a virtual organization that will serve you know big career uh, roles for each of you. And so, you know, Penn's a really, I've taught at a lot of law schools, Penn Law School is a very collegial, comfortable, happy place, and that, I think, will serve you well, in addition to, you know, all this great teaching and so forth that we say we're doing to prepare you for the future, but that you're going to know all each other, and that, and that each, of, each of you is a resource for the others uh, in a world in which people don't stay connected to one or even two organizations over the course of their career. Okay, we've now, um, asked a very important question to you guys, I know, uh, but we're now going to have uh, Dick Herring talk. And Dick, while you were gone, we have completely explained how the housing bubble happened, the role of securitization, and why the more, and, and what's going to happen in bankruptcy. So, so your job is to completely explain in you know, 12 minutes or less the banking angles. Ah, well, I'm, I deeply apologize. Uh, I was, uh, in a very indirect way, a victim of the uh, crisis spillover. I'm a director of a money market mutual fund, and as those of you in the law school know better than my colleagues at Wharton, that imposes certain um, legal constraints, and one of them is when markets cease to function, you have to value those things, and that does require everybody to uh, take a look. Um, it sounds like you've already talked about how we got to this stage, so. Um, let me just point out that it, it would never have happened except in the very unusual context of this incredible rise in prices. Um, and a very complex securitization process that fed the markets and, and permitted the rise in prices, which really broke down in, in at least seven different stages. Um, various sorts of predatory lending, predatory borrowing, adverse selection, moral hazard, principal agent problems, all this is familiar finance stuff. But essentially um, what turned out, what started as an enormously useful innovation, securitization is probably one of the most important innovations that has occurred in finance, um, was carried too far. It became so complex and so opaque that it was very difficult for anybody to value it well. However, it grew very rapidly. And uh, the subprime piece of this can be traced in the purple bar. Notice that it was really quite trivial until 04, 05, and 06. 
And the reason for this, or one of the primary reasons that it grew so rapidly, was um, the most robust of all economic laws, the law of unintended consequences. What happened was that um, HUD was putting pressure on Fannie and Freddie to pour money, more money into low-income housing and uh, in amounts that were much greater than the supply that was being built. So they were able to satisfy that demand by buying AAA rated tranches of subprime securitizations. So you had this automatic demand from, Wall Street, from uh, Fannie and Freddie for Wall Street to produce these things. And it turned out that if you could put pools of these subprime mortgages together and tranche them just right, you could end up with as many as 70% of them turning out to be AAA rated tranches that you could feed to Fannie and Freddie. And so that's a lot of what, what drove it. Um, they also had to rely increasingly on uh, collateralized debt obligations to sell it because you had a lot of junk that had to be placed somewhere. Hedge funds ended up being the, the primary buyers of these. And by and large, the hedge funds did their homework. Um, these are very complex documents to read, sometimes 500 pages or more, but they actually did rather well with it. It was not where things blew up. But it became the most important source of revenue for uh, LCFI as a, uh, a piece of jargon that the Bank of England and the IMF use for large, complex financial institutions. It's the 16, what they consider to be, the most systemically important institutions. Interestingly, it didn't include the first to fail. Uh, but it included four of the five U.S. investment banks um, and the largest European and U.S. Um, uh, commercial banks. And much of this was uh, uh, revenue generated by the investment banks. All of this came to a halt quite suddenly when people began to look at the statistics and understood that the, the um, delinquency rate on subprime mortgages in particular, but actually on all classes of mortgages, was startlingly higher than the worst case anyone suspected. Now these things are usually looked at in vintage terms because the way a, a subprime mortgage is uh, structured, you would expect it to do reasonably well for two and a half or three years at the teaser rate because it's meant to be well below market rates. But then to run into trouble after the third year when you step up to what's usually a penalty rate. The assumption with that rising houses we all saw was that nobody was ever really going to have to pay the penalty rate because they'd simply refinance at a 30 year. Well, when prices go down, that's just not possible. It also revealed, because notice you're seeing delinquencies from virtually the day the mortgage was made, it indicated that there were a whole new category of, of home buyers that were entering the market so that, that you probably couldn't make any judgment from the past data because you were being inundated by speculative buyers and buyers of third and fourth homes and rental properties and it was just nothing like the old subprime market which actually did do some good. Alte was quite similar, it was uh, low doc or no doc loans. Um, and it undermined the, the, the severity of the departure was sufficient to undermine the three pillars that had supported private securitizations. Um, and private securitizations uh, were made possible because you had to replace the government's guarantee. Um, and you could do that by using statistical models um, that would establish the subordination or the over collateralization you needed. Well, the people who had the, the, the greatest incentive to get those models right uh, screwed up in the most spectacular way. It was Bear Stearns, Merrill Lynch, UBS, Citibank. They were all the largest originators, and they all had the largest losses, which indicated they really didn't know how to price the stuff. The ratings agencies um, were also uh, heavily implicated because you saw multiple tier downgrades. You had three tranche downgrades, which took lots of assets out of that critical investment category into um, sub-investment grade and made it necessary for a lot of firms to sell the stuff. Um, and then the final line of defense, if you didn't believe all the others, was to buy monoline insurance that would insure you against a downgrade. 
And once the monolines had to pay up, it became clear they simply couldn't. So uncertainty about the size and location of losses raised concerns about credit and counterparty risk. Um, and it, it quickly spread to any market that relied on statistical models, ratings, or monoline insurance. This is a heat diagram um, uh, from the IMF. It's green to be good here because that means your volatility of prices is normal. Yellow is not so great. It means that you've got a, a uh, volatility that's one to four times greater than normal. And black is really terrible. It means you have volatility that's greater than four times, which probably means there's no trading at all. Well, how do you deal with a faltering non-bank institution that's too big or too complex to fail? Um, in March, the Fed crossed the regulatory Rubicon without having the appropriate weapons, uh, and it bailed out Bear Stearns. The traditional U.S. view had been that investment banks don't impose systemic risk. Uh, they're unlikely to be subject to runs because customer funds are thought to be um, strictly segregated from the firm's own funds uh, and not commingled with those of the firm. So uh, unlike a bank where your deposit is a claim on the bank itself, you should have um, a segregated account with a securities firm. We see that isn't always true everywhere. Um, they hold mainly marketable securities and should be able to deleverage very quickly without suffering illiquidity loss if they lose funding. And uh, they don't really have access to the systemically important um, large payment system. That's all done through banks, so you could regulate them through banks. The demise of Drexel Burnham, which was the most profitable house on Wall Street in the 90s, um, actually confirmed the fact that um, uh, this seemed to work. The spillovers from Drexel were so minimal that uh, the stock market actually rose on the day that uh, Drexel declared bankruptcy. The EU has long held a contrary view. Most of the European banks have long had the full range of securities powers. The largest U.S. investment banks all have substantial banking operations in the EU, and the EU has, in, has really insisted that they be subject to consolidated prudential oversight that's comparable to that applied to large U.S. banks. And so finally, with great reluctance, the five leading investment banks agreed to a very odd sort of arrangement where there would be voluntary consolidated supervised entities that were subject to Basel II-like regulations, which led to greatly increased leverage. What's changed? Well, their portfolios have shifted greatly in favor of illiquid assets. So that means deleveraging is much more difficult to do without suffering illiquidity losses. This shows their commitments to leveraged uh, lending, stuff they hoped to sell on but got caught with. Their funding has been internationalized, which normally is good, except in the event of a crisis where local regulators are very reluctant to let them shift funds from one place to a, a place where they have shortages. You see here the huge increase in leverage that took place with Bear leading the pack at, a, at the top at about 32 to 1. That means they had $32 of debt for every dollar of assets, which is uh, no margin for error, any volatility, and they're, they're cooked. Um, there was a growing reliance on third-party repos to fund the balance sheet, um, and the repo market had grown incredibly in ways that I think very few of us understood. In 1990, it was about 13 percent of FDIC-insured bank deposits. By 2007, it was 60 percent. So you had, um, for the third-party repos, very short-term and a, a broad range uh, they were also deeply committed to the credit default swap market, which is the most opaque market in the world, and makes it impossible to know who's going to say ouch when somebody uh, goes into default, because it's over the counter, um, and you may be holding an asset, but you may not be holding the credit risk associated with the asset if you've traded to someone else. When um, Bear fell, it, it should have been easy to see that it was headed for disaster. As you can tell, when their hedge funds blew up, they quickly lost value. Um, they were far and away the most exposed. Notice Lehman Brothers, on the other hand, had seen it coming and tried to be, stay as liquid as possible, but Bear Stearns was, was really totally unprepared. Uh, and the, the regulators should have been able to see it. Um, this shows the credit default swap market where people thought Lehman was the weakest of all, but you can see that uh, uh, quickly behind it is, is um, Lehman.
The demise was very rapid. Um, their prime brokerage specialty um, turned out to be a liability as all the hedge funds withdrew, and people simply refused to do business with them. The Fed decided to intervene. Um, they um, did so in such a way that uh, Chase got a, a wonderful deal. Um, the Fed took uh, $30 billion worth of uh, not very good assets, and we don't know how not very good they are from Bear's balance sheet. Uh, Chase has to bear the first billion of loss, but the next $29 billion is for the Fed to, to handle. This is all done very opaquely. It's handled in an SPE or a special purpose entity off balance sheet. Nobody knows what it is. The Fed feared the consequences of bear bankruptcy because they lacked the tools to deal with it. They would be submitted to the normal bankruptcy procedures, which uh, I'm sure David has, has explained to you, but they feature stays. And stays in a market that trades heavily can uh, lead to very rapid spillovers on counterparties that don't know how to hedge and dislocations in interbank markets. So the, bank, the central bank was very concerned that the market that's critical for the U.S., how to sell its own debt, would fall apart. Well, policy interventions after that appeared increasingly ad hoc and increasingly desperate, which um, may have been an attempt at constructive ambiguity, but I think actually led to destructive ambiguity. This, I thought, captured it rather well. This is a, a fairy tale ending, but you may remember that the fairy tale did not end well for Humpty Dumpty. Uh, this was before AIG fell, but you can see Freddie and Fanny on the ground and Lehman as well. Um, and uh, there's, there's a little uh, a blurb on top saying shares in glue are going up, but that's about it. Everything else is down. But it, it reflects the uncertainty. The markets reacted very sharply to the uncertainty. There was a flight to quality that was really extreme and totally unanticipated. It's very odd that the government felt they could let Lehman go, but, but saved Bear, because Lehman was in every way more larger and more likely to be a systemic problem, but they thought they knew the consequences. It turned out they really didn't. Um, it led to a huge flight to quality, huge outflows from institutional money market mutual funds that are thought to be the next safest thing to treasury bills, um, and normally liquid markets simply seized up. Um, I was uh, on another conference call when all this happened because one of our larger clients, one of the largest central banks in the world, decided they wanted out of the United States, and at 4.45 in the afternoon, they wanted 4.5 billion back. Um, and, you know, that's sort of hard to do. Uh, luckily, at 4.55, they decided there was nothing better they could do with their money. But you saw a loss of confidence in the financial system. This is something from, I, I highly recommend this week's New Yorker. It's full of these wonderful cartoons. Uh, can I interest you in a faith-based account? Or a more desperate sign of panic, give me all the money back in my account. <laughs> um, but really, the, the run and the panic has happened more in terms of uh, the institutional world than the retail world. The retail world has, by and large, felt protected by deposit insurance. Well, the Treasury was clearly spooked. This was not the reaction they had hoped for. They um, responded with an unprecedented and an ill-defined guarantee of $3.4 trillion without really any consultation at all to, to save all of the money market mutual funds um, and the $700 billion uh, bailout. And I guess I should probably stop there since I'm way over. Um, but if anybody would like to hear my views on the bailout, um, I've got them here. Uh, I'll just close with one cartoon, which is, I think kind of funny. I think the result of this is huge moral hazard in the system. This is a pair of kids with a, uh, a piggy bank saying, now we just have to sit back and wait for the Fed to bail us out. <laughs> I, I think they've sort of misconstrued um, exactly what's behind this moral ambiguity. And I think the Treasury also completely failed to understand the political resonance of this. Uh, this was not the view of taxpayers. I'm a financial genius. Uh, there's real anger and uh, outrage in the country at large. So I, I will uh, skip over my, I'll spare you my views on the bailout, and um, once again, I apologize for being late, but uh, this is a crisis that really is having spillovers in all sorts of unanticipated un un dimensions. Uh, I have a question for Dick. Dick, how are we gonna know if, it's, if the fix is working? 
Well, the fix will start working when you start seeing um, volumes in things like commercial paper uh, resumed. You're not going to see it ever happen in subprime again. People have realized, even though they used to trade like money market instruments, that they're in fact enormously complex, they're idiosyncratic, they require um, understanding very complicated documentation, and so that's gone. Um, but commercial paper should resume, um, and more simple, I think in time you'll see a return to a simpler style of securitization, which is really quite essential for the system to go forward. For example, if we believe that securitization is dead and gone forever, we're going to have to think of a way of funding about $6 trillion worth of needs that have been securitized in the private sector. And that requires an enormous influx of capital into the uh, banking system that really nobody knows how to put in at this point. David's asked me to ask you, and I'm sure everyone else wants to know too, so what is your view on the bailout? <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I, I guess I'd like to start with what I think we would, I think most of us agree should be the criteria you judge a public policy by. And this is a public policy that I think has really been in, in really inflicted by fear mongering. Um, the chairman of the Fed, who's somebody who's brilliant and I highly respect, apparently told Congress that um, if they didn't pass the bill over the weekend, there would be no economy on Monday. And that's such a, an extraordinary overstatement. Uh, but it can create fear and a crisis in its own right, and markets responded accordingly. But if you've got a good public policy to deal with this, you really should start with a clear diagnosis of what's wrong. And you should have clear goals that address the problem. Um, ideally, it should be efficient. It should accomplish whatever you're trying to do at the very least cost, and it should minimize distortion of incentives. This is particularly important in the long run, or you'll get moral hazard problems that will make the next round even worse. It should also be equitable, um, equitable in both senses. It should treat uh, like firms the same, and it, should treat, uh, it shouldn't worsen the income distribution. And most of all, it shouldn't minimize loss to taxpayers. Well, I think the proposal, and this is the two and a half page version, I confess I haven't read the 450 page version, but I have no reason to believe it's better. Um, anything that, control, that, that contains protection for wooden arrows in it uh, uh, cannot be an improvement. Uh, another example, this is I think yet another example of legislative haste with the hope of reform, maybe at leisure, and the uh, reform seldom ever really comes. Paulson's diagnosis through all of this has been that it's the illiquid, more, illiquid mortgage assets that are choking off the flow of credit and that it's really a liquidity crisis. And I think it's been apparent for at least a year it isn't. It's a solvency problem. Um, while the subprime related mortgage assets have become illiquid, they can't explain the breakdown in other markets. Um, the problem there is counterparty risk, and there's counterparty risk because people don't trust each other. Part of it is that the Fed, um, it, it's, part of it is fed by uncertainty about the extent and location of losses, and part of it is, is genuine uncertainty about what in the world the regulators may do next. The central bank was withdrawing money not because of fear of counterparties, this was uh, as good a counterparty as they could find in the market, but because they didn't know what those crazy U.S. regulators might do next. The crisis led to a capital shortage for very obvious reasons. There were direct losses for, from holdings of securities that were downgraded. There were losses from honoring implicit guarantees of off-balance sheet stuff that for business reasons you really had to put back onto your balance sheet. And um, you did that either by extending liquidity or buying them. Um, there were losses from pipelines of assets that you thought you could securitize, but since the market dried up, that was no longer possible. That was really the Northern Rock story. Um, there were losses from the important continuing source of bank revenue, which we saw was as much as 40% for many of these uh, institutions, and they had no good business model to fall back on to change that. And the challenge, so was to replace the lost capital but also to stockpile capital as a precaution against losing access to other funding. Uh, 
And the big unknown was how soon the um, securitization market would come back, how much of your clients' needs you'd have to start funding on your balance sheet. Well, the, the fundamental problem is there's just way too much leverage in the economy. Um, aggregate debt rose from 163% of GDP in 1980 to 346% in 2007. Household debt increased from 50 to 100%, so it doubled over that period, and financial institution debt nearly uh, went up six-fold over that period. Um, and so uh, this doesn't even include the embedded leverage in, in derivatives and futures and, and things like that. Um, with almost one year's inventory of unsold homes, we know there's going to be further downward pressure in prices. So we're not near the end of it yet. Um, and um, the, uh, that's going to require more capital still. Uh, although we've pretty much stopped building new homes, um, we're adding to the supply of unsold homes by foreclosures. Deleveraging is never unpleasant, uh, never pleasant. Um, it happens all the time. Uh, but uh, the treasury system is all going to depend on the price they pay. Uh, and I have no, con no confidence in their ability to price these things properly. If they price it at fair value, then they're gaining nothing. Um, doesn't address the capital problem. If they price them at a discount, as I think they intend to do, then you're distributing subsidies willy-nilly. You're going to subsidize some, in, some firms that don't require recapitalization. And um, you may not meet the needs of firms that really do need to recapitalize. It's furthermore inequitable because it's going to be rewarding the most imprudent and competent investors at the expense of taxpayers who've generally been less well off than the executives and traders who made these decisions. Um, and it really distorts incentives for taking risks in the future. We have a much uh, better way of dealing with it if they'd only used it. And you've seen that used with WAMU and Wachovia. The, now that almost all of the systemically important institutions, now that AIG is gone, now that um, all the investment banks are gone, they're all banks. And we have a very robust mechanism for dealing with bank failures and injecting new capital in banks. We have a prompt corrective action system which really induces institutions to find private sector solutions without taxpayer help before they reach extremists, as happened with WAMU and um, could have happened with Wachovia. We're still not sure. Um, and if they do become insolvent, the FDIC has a perfectly uh, good set of tools and lots of experience in dealing with that. So I think um, it, it's a crisis that's actually been made worse by what policymakers have chosen to do. And other than that, it's pretty good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, we're at the end of the time. People have class. I would like to thank each of our panelists for coming uh, to enlighten us. And I just urge all of you who are law students to, you know, Learn from this and think, hey, I should take securities law, I should take corporate law, I should take bankruptcy, I should take Tom Baker's insolvency seminar. Um, and, and think you know, a lot and, about and, entering the distressed best debt business. Yeah. There's and, a lot and, of that. And, and, and take advantage of the opportunity to cross-register at, you know, a pretty unbelievable institution just across the street that was nice enough to send us uh, Susan and, and, and Dick this morning. So, and thank you all for coming.